Jody, thanks for being here. Tell us who you are and who you're affiliated with. So, um, Jody Holtzman, I am Senior Vice President of Thought Leadership, and my Twitter handle says that I was also raised on rock and roll. <laughs> um, I, um, I work for AARP, uh, which is a uh, nonprofit organization, for those that don't know, uh, that speaks in for the interests of people over 50. That's great. Well, and your thought leadership is partially around the issue of entrepreneurship. Right. So when I uh, was tapped to create this function uh, two years ago by the new CEO, um, you know, it, it was quickly apparent that it, there was no shortage of thought leaders at AARP. But as you would expect, there were thought leaders in areas related to the traditional agenda of the organization around Medicare and around Social Security and caregiving and livable communities and mobility and all these kinds of things. It was obvious that um, there was a need to find a new way with new non-traditional audiences for AARP to play if we were to be really executing on our mission. And our mission is to enhance the quality of life for all as we age. It's a ageless mission at the same time, you got to be 50 to get into the club. Well, hey, um, you got a lot of people in that club today. Uh, 37 million. So, uh, you know, more members than there are people in many countries. Um, and what's fascinating is that it's 37 million people that actually crosses three to four generations. So, you know, you have 50 to 60 year olds, you know, who are working, who are uh, st actually 50 to 70 year olds who are still working. Um, you, you have my parents, you know, are members. Um, so it's, it's really uh, quite an extensive uh, array. So tell me about some of the traits of this 37 million people that are growing very rapidly or continuing to grow, I should say. Well, I, I, there, there's a couple of things. The, the first thing to recognize is that in the 20th century, um, longevity uh, benefited from the addition of 30 years. So from the beginning of the 20th century to the end of the 20th century, the lifespan of Americans had 30 more years. Wow. The fascinating thing is that it's not 30 years at the end of life, it's 30 years in the middle of life. And so this is active, vibrant life. And so, you know, the traditional views of, quote, retirement, which basically were equated with inactivity, is, is just absolutely no longer the case. You know, the joke about uh, President Eisenhower, for example, when he left the White House, uh, they asked him, Mr. President, what are you going to do now that you're retiring? He said, well, I'm going to go back to my house in Virginia. I'm going to sit on my porch in my rocking chair. And after about six months, I'm going to consider rocking. <laughs> you know, that you know, view of, of inactivity is nobody's model for what they want to do with, with, with their life. And in fact, it's just the opposite. Regardless of age, everybody has their own what's next. The challenge that people have is that they're not sure exactly what it is. And even when they are sure what it is, they're not quite sure how to navigate how to get there. So this is an area that is new for us. We call it life reimagined. And, it, and it's something that, that we're focused on. One component of that is that you have this long-term trend of people in their 50s and 60s starting companies at twice the rate of people in their 20s. And this is from uh, the Kaufman Foundation. They've been tracking this for a long time. Um, and it really is small business America. There's also a component of, of those who are, you know, um, uh, over 50 and, and venture-backed, or, or will be. I mean, I was just talking with, you know, uh, Susan Strasberg, who uh, um, I don't know her age, but I would venture to guess that she's in our, our, our sweet spot. And, uh, you know, founder of uh, Edgar.com, you know, went, went public in, in the 90s. She just started her latest startup. I was at a session earlier today with Frank Moss, you know, who was at Lotus and IBM and then, you know, ran the MIT eight, uh, Media Lab. Uh, and he's got three companies and, you know, Frank's older than I am. Um, so uh, there is a lot of very, very innovative activity going on. And there's also just people who want to, you know, stay vibrant and, and active. So do, do this 
kind of new group of entrepreneurs at this stage of their life, do they, do they need anything different? They're obviously people with a lot of ex experience, clearly talent in their known areas. You know, uh, what have you found out about this group of entrepreneurs? Uh, uh, there's a couple of things, and, and, and I want to swing back to you. So when you think about entrepreneurship in this area, there's entrepreneurship by people over 50, and there's entrepreneurship for people over 50. Sometimes those two come together and you have a twofer. Yeah. Um, but uh, for entrepreneurs who are over 50, um, really what, what they're looking for and, and what they need is... Um, their own mentors, and they, you know, need that peer-to-peer -peer community. They need easy ways to just figure out how to incorporate and know whether or not the right way is an LLC or an S corp or whatever. They need to find ways to conduct market research that doesn't break the bank. Um, so, on the one hand very, very similar common needs to entrepreneurs of any age. Mm -hmm. At the same time, because they have this life experience, um, speaking with people who have already, at this stage of life, done it mm -hmm. is, is always good. So if you think about even you know, the peer-to-peer -peer communities that have developed in, uh, with different disease uh, groups. Mm -hmm. Why is it that people join those? I want to talk to somebody who's at a point in life facing similar challenges that has already gotten there, has figured out how to get over those hurdles, and I want to benefit from what they learned. Um, very similar here. So the, this group of entrepreneurs, um, they have knowledge, they have talent, they're now taking a risk at a very different point of mm -hmm. their life. And you're finding um, that this, there's, there's no adversity to this risk, or they're um, finding ways to alleviate that risk, whether it's through you know, peers who have some knowledge and the things you've talked about. Are they finding any other unique ways to alleviate the risk at this point of their life? I th well, first of all, you know, it, it's essential to you know, just be clear that you know, when you become an entrepreneur, you are engaging risk. You know, they call it risk management, not risk aversion. Right. So, uh, so the objective here is to figure out how to manage mm -hmm. that, that risk. Where uh, people in their 50s and 60s benefit is that, one, they do have a lifetime of experience. And certainly those that have been in the business world who decide to, to venture into this area uh, have that, you know, that, that breadth and depth of knowledge and, and expertise. The other thing that they have that perhaps younger entrepreneurs don't have is they do have networks. Mm -hmm. And there is certainly a section of them, you know, a segment of them that, that have financial savings. Right. And, and so they have a cushion um, and uh, that is, you know, is, is important. Is there any particular business areas you're seeing them go into? I mean, are they going, are many of them looking for high growth business? Are they looking for lifestyle businesses? Are they just looking to, to pursue that passion of uh, an entrepreneurial dream that they haven't thought about before or well, haven't been it, able to take? Yeah, it, it falls into two categories. So there are those that are doing it for aspirational reasons, mm -hmm. and then there are those that are doing it initially out of financial necessity. But even that, there can be an aspiration. Mm -hmm. um, but the initial motivation is I have to pay the bills, I have to find a, a source of income. Um, when you look at the, the, um, the different areas, first of all, there's a huge percentage, and this is true for uh, you know, incorporated and, and unincorporated businesses across the country, huge level of sole proprietorship. Okay. So you know, it's the person who worked at a firm, was a lawyer, was a professional of some type, was an accountant. I've always worked for the firm. I'm tired of that. I'm hanging out my shingle. I'm going to work for myself. There's other people who didn't know exactly what they wanted to do, but they knew they wanted to be their own boss. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's the aspiration. And then it's a matter of finding those mechanisms. And they, you know, it might be the couple that, you know, buys the, the, the bread and back breakfast. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, um, the person uh, or the couple that uh, buy a, um, a franchise. Mm -hmm. 
uh, one of the quickest ways to, uh, and, and for them, what they need are services, and this is true for anybody that goes in the franchise areas, you know, figuring out what's a good franchise and a bad franchise, right. you know, because those deals, you know, are, are made to make money for the franchise. And, yeah. uh, you know, there, there are ones that work better or less well <laughs> for uh, those that become the franchisees. Um, no less true for, for older uh, entrepreneurs. Um, so, you know, typically it's people expanding in areas of knowledge and expertise, finding ways to do that on their own, um, and then sometimes it's just this, you know, I always wanted to have that, that B&B on, B &B on, uh, on, on, on the coast of New Hampshire and, you know, or Massachusetts or wherever. Wherever. Or, yeah. But you also said some of them are actually you know, we think about the 20 and 30 year olds getting venture funded and the 40 year olds, we don't necessarily think about those who would fall into this category, but certainly they're probably the most seasoned, most experienced. And as you said, some of them are getting external financing, not just using their own they resources. Are. They are. What's also interesting is that you have younger entrepreneurs who are finally finding this older market and, and this untapped need. Um, you know, so just to put some, some numbers on this, you're talking about people over 50, it's over 100 million people. They spend $3.5 trillion annually in consumer spending, right? I would argue that, and this is true for any uh, business, the one question you never want to get from your board of directors is, why did you leave money on the table by ignoring a market of 100 million people that spend $3.5 trillion every year? Absolutely. And that's just in the U.S.? And that's just in the U.S., right. So a campaign that we have with the venture community um, is called What's Your 50 Plus Strategy? So, um, you know, our uh, effort, it, it, we're trying to change behavior. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying to change behavior, you have to make it easy for right. people. So what we've asked, and, and we sponsor the National Venture Capital Association annual meeting, um, as well as other uh, events, our uh, request is add that single question, that's all, to your list of diligence questions when somebody comes in front of you with their hand out for money. Our assumption is, is that the first time you ask that question, the, the, the startup will be blindsided. They, mm -hmm. they really will have no answer. Right. Uh, however, they will then walk out of the room and they will start tweeting their friends. And they will say, if you're going in front of so-and-so looking for money, you better have an answer to this question. Right. And so I use the metaphor of chaos theory of the butterfly and the tsunami. And this is our effort at getting the butterfly to spread its wings so that there's a tsunami of activity so that companies are competing with each other to meet the needs and wants of people over 50. Is there anything that you'd like to share with the people that would see this uh, recording of what they should do for this segment of, of potential employers, employees, entrepreneurs, people? I, yes. Um, there, there's, there's two aspects to it. First of all, there's, there's just a huge need and really industries yet to be created just addressing the needs of people over 50, particularly people over 65, who, you know, 10,000 a day uh, in the United States, 10,000 people a day are turning 65. And that's going to be the case for the, same, for the next, I think, 17 years. Um, so, uh, you know, right now there's roughly 35,000 people over 65. By 2030, there's going to be 70,000. So the number is going to double. 70,000 million. Se I'm sorry, 70 million. Million. Right. So, uh, you know, the numbers are going to double. This is a huge area of, of, of need. And one category of the need is about um, real need, aging in place technology. How do, how do you, nobody wants to go to a nursing home, right? right. Everybody wants, number one thing when you ask people what do they want for their lives, I want to stay in place. I want to stay in my home, I want to stay near my friends, I want to stay in my community, I want to stay around with all the things I love and, and what I'm comfortable with. Um, people want to stay where they are. Well, the fact is, is that for that to happen, technology is going to have to play a role. Right. And um, how it is, how it fits with other technologies that are also meld with uh, remote health monitoring, but it's also a way to stay connected to your family and your friends, how it helps with mobility and, and getting about and living independently. Um, huge opportunity there. 
And that's an industry that only now is totally nascent. And just like the computer industry in the late 80s, early to mid 90s, when you had wonderful innovations, none of which talked to each other, right? What happened? You had the rise of the systems integrators to, to get all of these different technologies to talk to each other. That's a need mm -hmm. in, in this market right now. It's, it's the analogous situation. Um, another thing to, uh, to think about is that this population is no less aspirational than 20-somethings. Right. We all have hopes and dreams still. Um, it's the trip we never got to take. Uh, but this time, it's not just by ourselves. We want to take the family. Mm -hmm. Well, what's fascinating is if you go on t online to Kayak, to Expedia, to Travelocity, any of the online sites, you would not know from looking at that web page that over 50% of leisure travel is bought and paid for by over f people over 50, and 80% of luxury leisure travel is bought and paid for by people over 50. I want to go to that web page that speaks to me, right? Right. So you have situations now where a whole slew of, of uh, businesses are actually finding out, unbeknownst to them, that their largest potential market is this over 50 segment. Zulily, wonderful, wonderful uh, startup backed by Maveron. It's online clothes. For, for kids, gorgeous, really high-end clothes, colorful, beautiful clothes. Uh, they designed it to target uh, young mothers, only to find out their largest buyer group were grandmothers, right? Wizard 101, the most popular online game, targeted six to 11-year-olds, uh, just targeted the kids, only to find out that a huge part of their players are intergenerational, not just parents, but grandparents. Mm -hmm. Um, Nintendo designs the, the Wii when it first you know, was changed. They've gone back on it, but the original change, they were trying to grow their market younger, right? So that was the way they were gonna expand their market. Um, well, what they didn't realize was that the finger dexterity of a young kid was very similar to the finger dexterity of an older person. So all of a sudden, their Wii is getting bought by assisted living facilities and nursing homes because the program managers there uh, and program directors realized now they had something, a fun way to get people physically active, yeah. right? So it gets back to the question that you don't want to get from your board of directors mm -hmm. and the question we're posing to the venture community. What's your 50 plus strategy? It's not intuitive, particularly for most startups. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like mechanistically you have to impose this question to force a discussion. And so but my ask would be, impose the discussion because you will be well rewarded. This is 100 million people in the US. This is a three and a half trillion dollar market. What an opportunity. Jody, right. thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Laura.